injury to one is an injury to all, the old labor slogan goes. What if we applied that idea to the experience of Native people? How does the history of genocide affect us all, even today? This week, some people in the U.S. mark Indigenous Peoples Day, also called Columbus Day. It's a time to look back at Native people's history, but far better, says our next guest, if we all got a lot smarter about how the denial of self-determination to Native Americans set wheels in motion that affect all of us, even now. Denial of self-determination, dispossession, criminalization, no group feels those things more than Indigenous people but they're not the only ones. In fact, a better understanding of our indigenous history would reveal a lot about how we all live and why. So says the author of a new book, An Indigenous People's History of the United States. Author, historian Roxanne Dunbar-Ortiz is with us in the studio. Congratulations on the big new book, Roxanne. Thanks for coming in. Thank you, Laura. I'm happy to be here. So I'm kind of reading that message into your book, but I got it very strongly. This isn't a book necessarily for indigenous people. They may know this history. It's for the rest of us. Why is it needed? Yes, it's for, it's for everyone to understand, for the settlers, uh, immigrants, to understand indigenous people's experience of the United States and point of view. And as a historian, I, I wanted to really just call it the true history of the United States because it's not just there, well, there are two points of view. There are the colonizer and the colonized, but do you really want to identify with the colonizers? And yet that's exactly what our history has for the most part done. Exactly. What's different when you look at it from the colonized point of view? Well, first of all, you see uh, the United States founded as a settler state. Uh, it's a republic, it's called a republic. Um, the French called their republic a republic, but it was still a colonizer, colonized Algeria and Vietnam. But the United States, of course, is exceptional. Of course. And so it could not possibly be a settler state, couldn't possibly be imperialist. It's uh, rescuing people, helping people. Uh, the very first emblem of the Puritans of when they came over was a flag that had a, a sort of... Um, very tired, weary looking native person with a kind of limp bow and arrow say, please come help us, come save us. So that very typical idea that this was a land without people or culture that mm. needed the civilization that the settlers would bring. This was Zion, this was Jer the New Jerusalem. Uh, the Puritans um, had a whole uh, philosophy of ideology of uh, this being a place given to them by um, by their God. Mm. And very it's, different from South America, we're led to believe in our history books that here there wasn't a culture that you could see, like the Aztecs or the Incans. Right. Instead, there was this kind of roaming bands of people on horseback. In an untamed forest, a vast wilderness that, that had not been tamed. Of course, it's, it's not true at all. The, the Valley of Mexico um, influenced both South and North, uh, the birth of, of civilization, sort of like in the old world, the, the Tigris, Euphrates, uh, Egypt, uh, and it went everywhere. Corn and the farming went all the way up to the Great Lakes, to this area here, um, really to the subarctic. And so 99% of the indigenous population in North America were farmers who lived in towns and had store, grain storages and very sophisticated governments. And roads. And the roads are the most amazing thing. I, until I did this book, I, I, hadn't, I had known about the roads in the Southwest. They're very connected to central Mexico because that's my sort of specialized area. I had no idea the roads, there's, there was a road from Alaska down to uh, southern Mexico, like the Pan American Highway today. And these were, and, and roads crisscrossing that go from east to west, north to south, in every direction. They were all trade routes. And they were not paths, they weren't roads just for um, hunting paths or for migrations. Uh, they were roads that were used, they had stops, they had places to stay, they had um, markets and trade, and trade items from central Mexico ended up, you know, in, in um, what's now Quebec and the Great Lakes area, 
and vice versa. So all of those artifacts tell you that there was this enormous amount of trade. And in general, the, the um, Toltecs, before the Aztecs, uh, created turquoise as, as uh, uh, the means of exchange. So they had uh, monetary systems. It's fascinating. I learned so much from this book, I just have to say. So thank you for the many years you put in, into to writing it. You write repeatedly that you cannot talk about capitalism in the U.S. without talking about colonialism. Can you explain? Well, in general, I think you can't talk about capitalism without colonialism. Even Marx you know, said that the primary accumulation of capital came from the looting of the Americas and the uh, enslavement of Africans and, the, and of um, native peoples. The first century of Spanish Portuguese colonization, um, uh, native slavery was, was legal. So it was replaced by African slavery. Once the church, the church wanted to enslave the natives, have them for their own, to build their missions and so forth. But even interestingly, you say that the colonial class were many of them people who'd been if not enslaved, at least dispossessed inside the colonial countries, originally the not very United Kingdom. Yes, uh, United Kingdom and in Spain, um, the, those who were displaced by the fencing of the commons all over Europe and, and England uh, were without any means of income and they were thrown into labor in the textile mills as, uh, as sheep became a commodity. So the landless peasants who might maybe harvested berries on the forest or grazed their livestock on the landlord's right. land, on the, on the lord's land, um, were made pretty vulnerable. It was particularly vulnerable yes. to a promise of land that could be theirs. Yes, and it solved, as Peter Leimba uh, writes, it, it solves a contradiction between the um, creation of a, a landless, um, possibly volatile class of people who are very angry about their dispossession. Uh, so offer them land far away, and they too can be a lord. So the cla it's, a, it's an escape valve mm. for the mother country. And then the United States, when it's a republic, uses its colonization uh, of the rest of the continent as an escape valve from a volatile unhappy lower class. Don't, tr don't make trouble here, go west, young man. Right, and find some land and it will be your own. You said motherland, but you also talk about patriarchy. Yes. This really started, um, I mean, the oppression of women, of course, goes back, the division of labor and so forth. But in, in Europe and in England, um, women had a lot of authority, pre-Catholic, pre-church times of uh, being the medicine people, being the farmers, uh, the people who kept the seeds, uh, the spiritual people. And there were some men, but this was mainly a woman's role, uh, sort of the intellectual class. And with the fencing of the commons came, and the crusades, um, putting you know the, the lords and the monarchies and the church targeted then these people of pre-Catholic um, uh, religious practices, and uh, this is the burning, you know, the killing of the witches, a million, millions of people, mostly women, who were killed. So why, I mean, obviously you're fascinated and you have a personal relationship to these stories, and everyone should be interested, but that should word isn't all that effective. Why is it imp important to tell this story and for us to understand it today, us who are not indigenous people. We need to understand that um, what a settler state is and the role we play. I mean, half my family are settlers, right. the Scots-Irish on my Dunbar side. And um, I've really studied this sort of family history and, and they were among the losers on the frontier who ended up in Oklahoma. They couldn't, uh, you couldn't make a living farming if you didn't have, you couldn't complete compete with the plantation yeah. slavery. So you became a, a subordinate to them as a sharecropper or a tenant because they kept eating up land. And, and yet they kept their hope, you know, they would go to the next frontier and they were going to make it this time. And so they end up in Oklahoma and then the Dust Bowl and everyone is dispossessed so they go to California. But your other side of Cherokee. 
Yes, and so I have this, I have a split personality, <laughs> a split character, but I can, you know, I can see both sides. Well, but how, you still haven't explained how the settler history and that consciousness and that tradition plays out now or affects us Well, now. look at the Tea Party. Um, those are, you know, those are people who want uh, that dream back. Uh, they're mostly descendants of the old settlers. Uh, Spain had its old settlers too, you know, not being Jewish and not being uh, Muslim, that you, you could be an old settler and you had a certain nobility. So there's a sense, there was also an ideology created of nationalism during the Andrew Jackson era of um, the old settlers being actually the indigenous peoples, not only this idea of manifest destiny and Zion, but also that the, the Indians are fading away and they present to this, us settlers, as in Last of the Mohicans, now it's yours, we've had our time. You, you, it is now your land to take mm. care of. So that is very strong mentality that they are the indigenous, just like the Afrikaners yeah. in South Africa. And it also speaks to me, it seems, of the reality that we have had experiences of different economic systems in the United States on this territory, on this continent. Right. Um, going back and thinking about the pre-capitalist culture is liberating also in the sense that right. you stop equating civilization with a particular economic system. You could yeah. have had another one. There was another one. Yeah, and it was, it was socialistic, you know, the uh, indigenous socialism collectively. This is why uh, native property wasn't recognized because it was collectively owned. And then they tried to allot it, you know, to create, they literally put in this, you know, the Dawes Act, the Allotment Act, that, that selfishness had to be created right. for civilization to flourish among the native people. But the other, the other aspect I think that we have to be aware of is that every inch of territory in, uh, that is now the United States was taken by warfare, mm -hmm. war on the native people. Many of these were genocidal wars, but in every case, native people resisted one way or another to stay on their land. They don't just give up. And in this, in this uh, 300 years of warfare, a hundred of it, under United States Republic, preceded by 200 years of, of settler colonial warfare, most of it by local militias, armed militias, population, um, a certain kind of warfare developed that is the root and foundation of the U.S. military, mm. acted out time and again. You look at Vietnam, you know, it was just, it, it resonated so much mm. with the Indian Wars. They even use a lot of the same terminology that they used, like Indian country. You're pretty critical of, of corporations and foundations in their relationship to native land and native issues. Do you want to talk about that a little? Native people are kind of the canaries in the mine, yeah. you know, in the 19th century. Um, the United States government, which had a federal trust responsibility under the treaties to uh, protect native land from outsiders, from settlers coming in or companies coming in. And instead they did the opposite and they would give leases and give uh, contracts without consulting the native people. So the corporations ran rampant um, from the beginning of the Industrial Revolution. In Oklahoma, it was mainly petroleum and mining. Um, in the West, all through the West, mining, seizing land, simply transferring it or making native land into so-called public lands. So. Um, you have dedicated a lifetime to writing history that refuses to um, do anything other than apply a race, gender, and class line to everything that you do. You've also been actively involved in movements going back to, well, the 60s, but through the American Indian Movement, AIM, and, and right to the present. 
any lesson to people out there or, or message to people out there who may think, oh, this, I've, this is old political correctness, we've done this, now we can all just be one people again, we don't need this one's history and that one's history, we're ready now for a new, a new era. You know, Native people may be in a stronger position politically almost than any other group in the United States right now. And I think the people are looking, you know, to Native Americans, well, what is it going on? The Idle No More really yeah. um, alerted people. And well, they talked something. on this program about how Native treaty rights might be the way we stop corporate exploitation exactly. of, of the dirty dar car tar sands or other dirty oil resources. If, if with democracy within Native nations who can control the, the tribal governments that are so attached to the federal government, that's been a long struggle to break that. Yeah. Uh, colonialist tie where they, you know, that's who they answer to rather than the people, uh, then it's a very, very strong uh, um, basis for fighting the corporations. But it's still important that we tell these people's histories. It's important that we tell all people's history, but especially Native people, because it is the history of this country, right. you know, and it's what is lost. We should really be mourning it what was lost with the destruction when uh, when that first chat when people read that first chapter follow the corn I think there'll be this this great sense of uh, there's a great sadness I think yeah. in people already that native people the genocide uh, but there are two things you know it's worse than you imagine right. what it was lost but also you know don't give up on native people they survive they're survivors and they have survivor skills. They have survived the worst genocide in human history and um, the greatest numbers over the greatest time. And they know, they know a lot that uh, is going to be very important as we face uh, some difficult times ahead. Well, Roxanne, thank you for bringing us so many more stories that I hope people will come to remember and appreciate. An Indigenous People's History of the United States is just out. We'll put a link at our website. Roxanne dunbar thanks for coming in. Thank you. Well, in North America, Canada is the same situation as the United States, and especially Alaska. It's uh, the issue between United States and colonists and uh, uh, our Aboriginal, our Indigenous peoples, our American Indians has always been a land issue. But it, it's something that we look back on because uh, some of the symptoms of colonization uh, is that um, we start to, to take on our own, you know, against each other. And that's, uh, I'm talking about internalized oppression. So if you look at the way that the industrialized development removes people from the land, if you look what systematically had been done to our people involving the church as well, uh, somehow there was already a master plan to remove us from our spiritual foundation, our values. They had to sever something because the power of the people was connected to Mother Earth, okay? And, th and that's what's happened globally. So we're talking about, as indigenous peoples, revitalization of a language that was taken away from many of our people. Uh, we're, call, we're talking about revitalization of our original instructions, those, those uh, natural laws of Mother Earth, that uh, we have to have an understanding, because if we don't have an understanding of the original instructions that were given to us, if we don't have that uh, understanding of our relationship to Mother Earth, that's a spiritual relationship, then we're vulnerable to embracing industrialized mindset. So we have actually been involved in our organizing work with our communities that we have to understand the symptoms of internalized oppression. Otherwise, we're going to have communities and families and individuals turn on us when we're starting to, to look at different alternative ways of rebuilding an economy. What is indigenous economy? Those are things that uh, we're, we're working towards uh, trying to develop, having seminars, indigenous-based seminars, deep thinking, critical thinking on what do we mean by green economy? When one of our elders from our Navajo people went to Geneva to the, 
to the to to the human rights uh, uh, over there. She said in their, her intervention that I'm here to speak for those that cannot speak for themselves. And she's talking about nature, and that was Roberta Black Goat, you know, from Big Mountain. You know, I remember that. And so my generation were taking that to another level. You know, where, where we have to look at a system that is not sustainable, a system that has been removed from nature until we we're part of a transformation, okay, and who we are and how we identify to that female creative principle, then we won't have a sustainable economic system. We're vulnerable, we're creating hybrid systems that will end up doing the same thing. The U.S. is under pressure to respond to allegations of war crimes in connection with its missile attack on Syria. But how do you assess disproportionate harm to civilians when this entire assault is disproportionate and premised on threats that seem to change from day to day? Residents in the village of Kafadrian did human rights groups a favor recently when they videotaped remnants of a Tomahawk cruise missile at the site of a strike that they say killed at least two men, two women and five kids. Only the U.S. and the U.K. have tomahawks in their arsenals, so Human Rights Watch is calling for an investigation. Further, the group is calling on the U.S. to take maximum precautions to obey international law, and they point out that law requires strikes be avoided that have a disproportionate impact on civilians compared to the expected military advantage. Well, here's the problem with that. When Barack Obama launched his campaign against what we've taken to calling the Islamic State, not even the president made a claim of self-defense. What is the military advantage? At that time, remember, American intelligence had concluded that ISIS posed no immediate threat to the so-called U.S. homeland. The no threat story was all over the front pages the same day as coverage of the president's speech. It's worth looking it up. Quote, some officials and terrorism experts believe that the actual danger posed by ISIS has been distorted in hours of television punditry and alarmist statements by politicians, reported the New York Times, September 10th. An anti-terror analyst with the hardly dovish Rand Corporation was quoted as saying, it's pretty clear that upping our involvement in Iraq and Syria makes it more likely that we'll be targeted by the people we're attacking. In other words, our attacks are the number one threat to our military advantage. So surely everyone is disproportionate. In his speech that night, the president himself acknowledged that intelligence agencies had not detected any specific plots aimed at the U.S. I bring up all this history from way back last month because now the same media is full of breathy talk of something called the Corazon Group, supposedly a pack of Al-Qaeda veterans whom the administration believe do intend to target the U.S., even if we've never heard of them, and even if in terms of threats to the president's home, if you don't mind me saying so, the U.S.'s own war veterans seem to pose more of a threat than anyone from Corazon. No Al-Qaeda vet has so far pulled off the amazing feat of opening the front door and running through the place. We'd never heard of Corazon before the air campaign began. Still, the director of national intelligence, James Clapper, did sound pretty scary when he said, in terms of threat to the homeland, Corazon may pose as much of a danger as the Islamic State. Pretty scary until you remember that if you actually believe the president, that's actually not saying much. The point is, actual evidence doesn't seem to be required for all this official talk of threat. But in that Syrian village, it's a very different story. There, the Department of Defense says they have no credible reporting of civilian deaths, video and eyewitnesses notwithstanding. They can, on the other hand, confirm several strikes to, quote, disrupt an imminent attack against the U.S. No further details. That's it. Boy, ain't it grand we're no longer living in the era of George W. Bush? Thanks. Write to me, laura at grittv.org, and tell me what you think.